Random Number Generation is a speedrunner's worst nightmare. You can play perfectly, but if the numbers don't go your way, you'll be left empty-handed. Don't be fooled though, speedrunning is not just a game of luck. It is a disciplined grind of consistent execution, and so long as you're consistent, the odds will eventually sway in your favour. In GoldenEye 007, nothing encapsulates the fight against RNG better than Frigate. The level is infamous for hosting speedruns that are incredibly dependent on luck factors. It's also a very complex level, and finding that balance between speed and consistency is something that speedrunners have battled with since the game's release. In this video series, we will explore the world records on this stage, and find out just how much luck is needed on these runs. Through this exploration, we will uncover how random number generation has shaped the strategies into what they are today. So sit back and relax as we take a deep dive into GoldenEye's most luck-dependent speedrun, Frigate. The classic GoldenEye speedrunner Wouter Janssen has set the most world records in the entire history of the game. One of his most famous and longest lasting was a time of 23 seconds on Frigate Agent, which he set on the 24th of September 2005. The time would remain the world record for over 13 years, and took a grind of 120 hours to achieve. Given the short length of the level, this would total approximately 15,000 attempts. The large number of attempts didn't have much to do with speed being an issue, as realistically, completing the level in 23 seconds is a fairly trivial task for top players. Rather, it all ultimately revolved around waiting for the required luck. Frigate speedruns are centered around a single dynamic, rescuing hostages from their hostage takers and waiting for them to escape. In order to rescue a hostage, the following steps need to take place. First, the hostage taker, which is a single guard pointing their weapon at the hostage, is killed. Once the death animation has completed and the guard has fully faded away, the hostage will pick one of six locations on the frigate as their escape point. When the hostage has reached its chosen escape point, it will be considered rescued and will fade out of the level. Not every escape point is equal, and the hostage will take a different amount of time to escape depending on which escape point they choose. Because of the way the pathing of the hostages works, there is a single escape point that is the fastest for every single hostage. We are going to talk about the specific odds of getting the correct escape point a bit later in the video. There are six hostages you can choose to release located throughout the level. Assuming they choose the fastest escape point, the hostages in order of possible escape speed are as follows. I'll show the theoretical optimal escape time on screen as well, but these times aren't realistic and would never happen in a real run. They are a pretty good guide to tell you just how fast each hostage is relative to each other though. The quickest by far is the bridge hostage. This hostage is unique because even though it chooses the same escape point as the other hostages, it can actually reach the escape point from the interior of the frigate. It only has to run a few meters into this small room before it is considered rescued, and that only takes a few seconds. The second and third fastest are these two hostages on the upper levels. You can see that they are pretty close to each other, so their escape times are pretty similar. This hostage here is a couple of seconds slower. Going down to the lower levels, this hostage is the fourth quickest. The hostage in the engine room is number five, and this hostage here is the slowest by far. This slowest hostage is actually pretty close in location to the fourth fastest hostage, but the problem is that he doesn't actually run the same way. Instead of taking the logical route, which would only be a few seconds slower, it chooses to run all the way around the engine room instead. The total number of hostages you need to save is different for each difficulty. On Agent, you need to save two hostages. On Secret Agent, you need to save four hostages. And on Double O Agent, you need to save five hostages. The speedrun on the Agent difficulty is really simple. We only need to rescue two hostages and place a tracker bug on the helicopter. The two hostages we choose to save are the second and third fastest hostages. These are chosen for a couple of reasons. The first is that they are very close together so you can kill them both at the same time. While you might think you'd want to save the fastest hostage, you actually lose any potential time gain because it's so far out of the way. The two hostages are also near the position we complete the tracker bug objective from. Instead of going all the way up to the helicopter, we throw it from this doorway. 
Once the tracker bug is thrown, it is imperative that we continue to look in the direction of the helicopter. If we look away, the helicopter will become unloaded and the tracker bug will not be able to land on it, which would fail the objective. The agent's speedrun is entirely capped by the speed at which the first hostage we release can escape. I like to break the speedrun down into two parts. The first part is the beginning of the run up until we kill the first hostage taker. Ideally, this should be done as quickly as possible. The speed at which we can kill this first hostage taker will essentially act as an upper limit for how fast the run can ultimately complete. The second part is simply waiting for the slowest hostage to be rescued. The time it takes to kill the second hostage taker, throw the tracker bug, and make it back to the boat to finish the level is theoretically slightly less than the time it takes for the slowest hostage to escape. In practice, however, these two events coincidentally line up pretty close to each other. The overarching strategy for achieving the world record is simply to repeat as many runs as possible and hope that the hostages escape in time. As I mentioned previously, there are six different escape points hostages can choose. It is absolutely essential for both hostages to choose the fastest escape point on the agent difficulty. The probability of any specific hostage choosing the fastest escape point is 15.6%. The chances of both hostages choosing the fastest escape point is 2.44%, or approximately 1 in 41. This is not the only random number generation that affects the speed of the hostages released though, as we also have to consider the death animation of the hostage taker. When you kill a guard in Goldeneye, they don't always die in the same manner. There are a total of 17 different death animations a guard can choose when killed with a bullet. These animations take varying lengths of time to complete and range from 2.13 seconds all the way up to 20.18 seconds. Once the death animation has completed, the guard will then fade out which will always take approximately 1.6 seconds. Given that the hostages only choose their escape point and start running once the hostage taker has faded out, this means that the death animation the guard chooses will affect how long it will take for the hostages to escape. A slower death animation will cause us to need to wait longer. Now, it's reasonable for you to jump to the conclusion that the faster the death animation, the better, but that may not necessarily be the case. The reason for this isn't obvious at all, and has to do with how NPCs move differently when they are either loaded or unloaded. When an NPC is loaded, it will react to obstacles and other NPCs. An NPC will remain loaded as long as it, or the room that it is located in, is visible. When an NPC is unloaded, it will completely ignore and run straight through obstacles and even doors. This ends up being a pretty important dynamic because as you can see, if I keep this first hostage loaded, he has a lot of trouble getting around this chair. But if he was unloaded, he would pass straight through it without a problem. In the world record strategy, you can see that after killing the second hostage taker, we immediately turn around so that the hostages and the room the hostages are located in are completely absent from view. This immediately puts them into an unloaded state, which is obviously what we want. But unfortunately, there is another mechanic that can cause NPCs to become loaded, and it is extremely difficult to control. This mechanic has to do with how characters pathfind when they are unloaded. The term pathfinding simply means the paths NPCs choose to take when moving from point A to point B. When a guard or hostage is unloaded, they will move along predetermined paths that are stored within the game. This diagram is a top-down view of the rooms housing the two hostages we free on Agent. The red lines between each circle are individual segments. The green circles represent the beginning or end of each segment. When a hostage or guard becomes unloaded, it immediately selects the beginning of the next segment as its target location. It then calculates the distance to that location from its current position. Now that it has a value for the distance it needs to travel, it then starts another counter that stores the value for the distance traveled in its current segment. When the value of the distance traveled reaches the value of the distance to the beginning of the next segment, the NPC is then placed at the beginning of the next segment. For example, if an NPC calculates that the distance to its next location is 100 units, and the NPC is moving at 10 units per frame, each frame the distance traveled will increase by 10 units, until its value reaches 100. The NPC will then teleport to the start of the next segment. Given that distance traveled is the only value that the game is keeping track of, any obstacles that may be in the way are completely ignored. However, if another unloaded NPC is already standing on the same location a guard or hostage is attempting to move to, it will change from an unloaded state to a loaded state and will need to run the entire segment again. 
Now that it's in a loaded state, it will need to navigate around obstacles and other NPCs. Because of this mechanic, it is imperative that the death animation of the second hostage taker is not slower than that of the first hostage taker. Even though the second hostage escapes quicker, we release him last, which means that most of the head's start has already been removed. If the death animation of the second hostage taker is too slow, the first hostage will get in front of the second hostage and cause him to begin his segment again. This loses far too much time. We are about to see how this all plays out in an actual run, but one final thing we need to know is that when you kill the second hostage taker, a guard is alerted and starts to run to your location. This guard is standing in the back corner of the room with the second hostage. It is this guard that causes most of the problems and drastically reduces the odds of a quick completion. When we turn around and pause to get out the tracker bug, this alerted guard will be running towards the position we were standing when we shot the second hostage taker. Unfortunately, because this guard is in an unloaded state, he will be occupying the same position the first hostage will be heading to. If the guard has not reached his destination by the time the first hostage taker arrives, the hostage will become loaded and start his segment again. This will obviously lose time by having to repeat the segment, but it will also mean that the hostage will get stuck behind the chair, eliminating any chance of a fast completion. This introduces even more luck into the equation, as it turns out that the speed at which this alerted guard will reach his target location will be different for each run. When an NPC goes from a loaded state to an unloaded state, the speed at which he travels along that first segment will differ depending on his speed and direction at the exact moment he becomes unloaded. As these factors are impossible for Bond to control, this becomes yet another random element that needs to go our way. To summarize everything we've learned, we need the following luck factors to go our way in order to successfully complete the optimal run. 1. A relatively quick death animation on the first hostage taker. 2. A death animation on the second hostage taker that is either as fast or faster than the first. 3. Both hostages need to choose the fastest escape point. And finally, the alerted guard must have a high speed when traversing his first unloaded segment. By 2019, Wouter's record of 23 seconds had been tied by 20 other players. Tying the world record was already seen as a chore, and often required vast grinds, so the prospect of going lower was rarely taken seriously. There was one player, however, that did put a lot of effort into this task. Arguably the most talented GoldenEye player of all time, Rayan Isran sporadically played the level for years. He would routinely finish sessions grinding for other records with a few frigate attempts. He had accumulated a respectable total of failed runs finished in 22 seconds, but the luck required to get a completed run eluded him. In 2018, he started putting a lot more effort into the grind for 22, dedicating entire sessions of play to the cause. On the 1st of June 2018, Rayan achieved this run. For the first time in history, someone had seen hostages complete on a 22 second pace run. But unfortunately for Rayan, he had missed the tracker bug throw. Aside from all of the luck factors surrounding the hostages, being able to complete the level in 22 seconds is far from trivial. Only a few players have demonstrated the ability to do this consistently. By far, the most difficult part of the run is throwing the tracker bug onto the helicopter. This has to be done extremely quickly, and there is barely any time to set up your aim. At this pace, the throw is incredibly precise, and it's not something you'd expect to be landing every time. Usually when a player misses the tracker bug throw, they would quit out of the run immediately. The last thing you'd want to happen is to have the hostages complete on a run where you missed the throw. At least when you quit out, you'd never know. Playing out the run is risky, and has resulted in heartbreak several times before. Rayan's 22 was definitely one of the most crushing fails in GoldenEye history. 
There's one final thing we need to talk about, and that's the very end of the run. You'll notice that the message stating that Objective A has been completed never shows on screen. Objective A is the one relating to the hostages escaping. You'll also notice at the end of every run there is a short period where the level fades out. For obvious reasons, this is simply called the fade out. The fade out lasts exactly one second, and during this time objectives can still complete. The in-game timer stops as soon as the fade out begins, which means that the objectives can still complete even after the timer has stopped. To give you an example of when the timer stops, here's a clip that actually shows the in-game timer on screen. You can see that as soon as Bond enters the boat, the timer disappears, signifying that the timer has stopped. The time shown on the very last frame the timer is visible will indicate the final time. In order to give the hostages the maximum amount of time to escape, our goal is to exit the level at exactly 22.9 seconds. Given that Goldeneye rounds down to the full second, there is literally no benefit in exiting earlier than at 0.9 decimal. 22.0 and 22.9 will both show 22 on the final screen. But at least 22.9 gives the hostages almost an entire extra second to complete. One great way we can time when to exit is by listening to the music. GoldenEye players have learned to use specific music cues to tell them how fast each run is. I've been asked so many times in the past if I ever get sick of listening to the same music over and over again. But the reality is that I don't even hear the music as music anymore. It has become more like a stopwatch, giving me real-time feedback on the pace of the run. By 2019, it appeared as though Rayan had relaxed from his efforts to attain 22. Frigate Agent was now the second oldest lasting world record on the ranks. No one else was playing for the record, so I decided to go after it myself. What should have taken weeks or months of grinding was amazingly achieved in only 30 hours of play. On the 31st of January 2019, I achieved this run. It was fucking, I think I got there too early, man. One of them escaped though. Holy shit. It was like, I thought it was perfectly timed, but I didn't hear that fucking thing. See, I didn't kill that guy, see if he prones me or not. This is too fast. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Yes, what the fuck? What the fuck? Oh, no. Oh, my God. So what exactly happened in the 22 second run? The first death animation was 2.8 seconds, which in my opinion is absolutely ideal. This should almost always give the alerted guard enough time to get out of the way. The second death animation was the fastest possible at 2.13 seconds. This gave the second hostage a large head start. This combination of a slightly slower first hostage and the fastest second hostage is probably, statistically speaking, the most likely to result in escape times quick enough for the world record. And as you would expect, this almost perfectly mirrors Rayan's failed 22 run, which had the exact same first death animation and a second death animation of 2.5 seconds. Of course, this doesn't mean that it isn't possible for a quicker first hostage to escape in time. It just means that the likelihood of it occurring is much, much lower. Besides, it may not do any good as GoldenEye times are measured to the second, so you would need to save an entire second to bring the record down to 21. We have never seen hostages escape this fast in the entire history of GoldenEye speedrunning, so it's probably impossible. On the world record run, the pace was particularly fast because I got boosted by a guard that we would normally kill at the very beginning. GoldenEye boosts save approximately 0.3 seconds, which put me well ahead of my target pace. You can even hear me say, this is too fast as I'm heading to the boat. This is too fast. Just before the very end, you can see that I slow down and briefly stop, and I use an R lean to time the exit. This helped me lose approximately 0.25 seconds. 
The final timer was likely around 22.8 to 22.9 seconds. Frigate has always had a bad reputation among speedrunners due to the extreme RNG required to achieve records. Many players in the past have spent up to hundreds of hours trying to beat their personal bests. Due to how the level works, there really isn't any concrete way to ease anyone's suffering. Hopefully, at the very least, this video will help to explain why the level is the way that it is. So it's not such a mystery. Based on everything I know, it doesn't seem like the hostages will be able to escape quick enough to complete the level in 21 seconds. I'd predict that 22 seconds is where the record will remain using the current strategies. There is one theoretical strategy that may make 21 seconds possible, but it is so hard to execute no one is even trying to make it happen. This strategy is definitely one for another video though. This analysis was pretty complex, but we've only covered Agent so far. On Secret Agent and Double O Agent, you need to save even more hostages. This rabbit hole goes far, far deeper. Let me know in the comments if you'd like me to explore the Secret Agent difficulty where things get a lot crazier. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you are having a fantastic day, and I will see you in the next video.